We've got developers up here in the front row building apps on Rust and Phoenix from an iPad. I mean, it's a wild west out there. So um, thank you, Curtis, for reminding us uh, things we've got to do. Okay, we're going to move on to our next speaker. We've got first time speaker here who's going to be talking about automated tests. So please put your hands together for Joe T. Mattel. Good morning, everyone. How is everyone doing? Good? All right. Um, my name is Jyoti Mittal, and I'm a QA architect at MSTS. We are a Kansas City-based B2B payment and solutions company, um, and I'm responsible for building their test architecture and quality engineering practice. By the way, we are hiring uh, test engineers and software engineers, so if you're interested, uh, please reach out to me after the talk. So today, I want to talk about some of the challenges that I have faced in implementing reliable test automation. And I want to share some of the tips that have worked for me in building the trust in automated tests. So let's get started. Now, just out of curiosity, how, how many of you are responsible for testing in your organization? Few of you? OK. And how many of you are implementing automated testing as part of your deployment pipeline? Wow, that's a lot. For those of you who are not, hopefully I can talk you into it. All right. In today's competitive market, every single company is obsessed with one thing, and that's speed. Doesn't matter whether you are a bank, insurance company, or a startup. Every company wants to go fast. And while and while the focus is on speed, often the quality gets compromised. And guess what? Speed without quality kills. Why? If you think about it for a minute, what is the value in deploying a broken application 100 times faster or 200 times faster? It's not going to make it any less broken. So if we are focusing only on automated deployments without building the quality in, we are ultimately setting ourselves for failure, just like this. And remember, we cannot afford to release a defective product. The risk is just too high. So what we really need is not just speed, but speed with quality. Now, in a recent DevOps survey, when the participants were asked where the main holdups are in their software production process, 63% of them said the delays are occurring at the QA stage of the cycle. And if you look at this chart, the delays in testing stage are almost double the plan code and the build stage. Now what that really implies is that QA has become the biggest bottleneck in DevOps. Now again, how many of you guys agree with this? How many of you guys agree that QA has become the bottleneck for you? Very few. What about rest of them? You guys think QA is all good? All happy with your QA process? All right. The reason cited by some of these participants was that QA, QA is still practicing traditional testing practices like manual testing. So if we have to move fast, then manual testing has to die. Now manual testing as your primary testing strategy is dead. Why? Because it's very, very slow. In today's digital time, when our release cycles are getting shorter, QA only has few days or maybe just few hours to do the job. So unless you have a big army of hundreds of manual testers, manual testing is not a practical option. And now, again, to clarify, manual testing in the form of exploratory testing will always be there. There will always be some human touch that will be needed. But manual testing as your primary testing strategy is definitely dead. So how do we remove QA as the bottleneck and start building our apps faster? And that's where automated testing comes to the rescue. Now, automation really is the dictate of today. It is at the heart of DevOps. So if you adopt DevOps, test automation is a must. And as QAs, we really need to level up on our technical skills. Because if you go to any job forum, forum nowadays, uh, whether it is monster.com or indeed.com, there are no 100% manual testing jobs. 
So we really, really need to focus on building those technical skills. Namai Kohn, who's a very famous author of the book called Succeeding with Agile. I don't know how many of you guys have read this, but I highly recommend it. So he gave a testing pyramid which describes all the different kinds of automated tests you have at different layers of your application. So at the technology layer, you have unit, component, and integration tests. Now these tests are usually written by the developers. At the business layer, we have functional and web services tests. Now these tests are usually written by the QAs. And if you see that inverted triangle there, that shows the test coverage at each of those layers. So your functional test has the maximum test coverage, end-to-end -end coverage, whereas the unit tests have the most granular layer coverage. Now a common trap a lot of us get into when we first start with test automation is to go crazy automating just one layer of the application. So 100% unit tests or 100% functional tests. Now best practice really is to automate the test based on the value they add to your application. So for example, if you are testing, say, a checkout process in an e-commerce website, then an end-to-end -end functional test will be appropriate. Whereas if you are testing, say, a business calculation for a discount in a shopping cart, then an, a unit test will most likely suffice. Now next, I want to talk about uh, some of the technologies that we used at different layers of the application at MSTS. So for our UI and web services testing, we are using Catalon Studio. Now Catalon Studio is a free test automation tool and it's, it's in the market just for four years, but right now it's among the top five automation tools available in the market. And it provides different modes in which both technical and non-technical members of the team can automate the test scripts. And that's highly valuable for any QA team because then you have both technical and non-technical testers on the same playing field. Uh, and that has really, really helped us in transforming 80% of our functional testers into test automation engineers. We also use AppliTools Eyes, uh, which is an artificial intelligence-based visual testing tool. So now, al along with our functional test, we can also add visual testing to our automated test, which means that we can also test the visual aspects of the application, like page layout or font or colors and other things. We use Postman for API testing, and for unit testing, we use Jasmine, Minitest, Mocha, and RSpec. So all of our automated test tests run in Docker containers on our CI servers. Uh, we use GitLab CI and Jenkins as our continuous integration servers. We use SiteSpeed IO and uh, new, uh, new Relic for our performance testing, NetSparker for our security testing, and all of our tests run on Gridlastic, which is a Selenium grid in cloud. Now we have more than 3,000 plus automated tests running in parallel on Gridlastic, um, and that has really helped us in getting faster feedback. Next, I want to share a sample test report with you. The important thing to note here is that it takes like three minutes to test 25 user stories. Now, if you have to do this manually, it would take at least six hours to do the job. And imagine, if you have to scale this to 10 more browser and operating system combinations, it will take at least 60 hours to do, do the job. Whereas if you run the same automated test in parallel for three minutes, you can save a lot of time and resources. So that's really the power of automation, that it can help you save time and resources. All right, so if automation is so great, what is holding people from embracing test automation? Why is it so hard to achieve? Now in my experience, it's one thing to create test automation system, set the system up and running, and it's another to really maintain it and keep it reliable. And it gets a lot harder as you scale. Now, a lot of companies are challenged with creating reliable test automation solution, and that kinds of make them wonder that, you know what, I like test automation, but I don't trust it. And one of the main hurdles in implementing a reliable testing solution is 
flaky tests. How many of you guys have come across flaky tests? Wow, lot of you. All right, anybody who has done serious test automation knows how painful they are, and it is the fastest way to lose trust in your automated testing. So what happens when you have flaky tests? Let's see. Now here is an example of unstable flaky test producing two different test results. In the first build, we have 6% failed, 92% passed, whereas in the second build, we have 4% failed and 93% uh, passed. So why do you think we get different results? And which of the ones are you gonna trust? And which of the ones are you gonna trust and go live to your production? None of them, right? So what it seems like is your Jenkins build is raising false alarms. It's raising false alarms and is crying wolf, similar to the story of the boy who cried wolf. You guys remember this story, the boy who cried wolf? Okay, quick recap. So there was this mischievous shepherd boy who would cry wolf to falsely alarm the village uh, to save their sheep. Now, just like in the story, nobody trusted the boy when the, sh when the wolf really came. A similar situation happened in one of my teams where our Jenkins build would be broken due to flaky tests and the team would investigate and then find out that the application is working, but the tests were flaky or faulty. So eventually they stopped paying attention to the broken builds and they started ignoring those automated tests. So, what, so what's the problem in ignoring the broken build? That's the problem in ignoring the broken build. It's a problem because it promotes bad culture. It promotes bad culture that it's okay to ignore a broken build. It promotes bad culture that it's okay to ignore failed tests. And remember, some of those tests can be valid failures. So one of the most important thing that it does, it, it completely discredits your automated testing effort. And now when nobody trusts your automated tests, the team has no other option but to go back to manual testing and QA remains a bottleneck. So this is my takeaway that flaky tests should not be tolerated. Just to give you a sense of scale, Google has around 4.2 million tests that run on their continuous integration system. Out of these, 63% have a flaky run over the week. And if you go to Google testing blog, Every second topic is about either identifying or monitoring or fixing flaky tests. So that gives you an idea about how important and how common this problem is. All right, so how do we build trust and create reliable tests? Let's see. Now the first step that I want to give you is to quarantine the flaky tests. Now what does that mean? It means removing noise from the signal. It means grouping your healthy, stable tests in one test suite, and then separating your flaky red tests in another test suite. Now, the idea here is not to abandon your flaky tests, but to separate them, fix them, and bring them back into the main build. Now, the first step in identifying a flaky test is to observe it over a pattern of large, large, last several builds. Now we use Catalon Analytics dashboard in order to automatically group our flaky tests and it tells you exactly what the flakiness percentage is for each of those tests. So we use Catalon Studio and Catalon Analytics is one of their dashboards. It's a free tool that you can use. So what this describes here is the number of tests that pass. So here six tests passed and then one of them failed. And if you click on the failed test here, it will show you the details of the flakiness percentage and the age of that test. Now it gives you the error. Uh, you can find out the error in the console log and figure out what is uh, what, why the reason for this failed test. The important metrics to note here is that flakiness percentage that you see there. This, the higher the percentage of the flakiness, the less stable that test is. 
Another dashboard that I want to share with you is reportportal.io. This is an open source uh, analytics dashboard uh, that uses machine learning in order to automatically analyze your test results. And this gives you the top 20 uh, flaky tests in your test suite. So if you see here, it tells you the flakiness percentage, like out of five out of five executions, the top test has been flaky which is 100% flakiness. So there are a lot of different tools in the market that can give you, uh, that can help you detect flakiness in your test suite. I have just mentioned uh, the free and open source tools, but there are a lot of licensed tools like Sauce Labs uh, and uh, C Lights that can help you do the job. One thing I want to really mention here is that if you're not using analytics for your test reporting, I highly recommend that you start using one because it really helps you in finding the high risk areas of your application as well as it can help you detect any flakiness in your test. So you, you can have a better control over the product quality by using the analytics based test reporting. All right, the second um, tip I want to give you is consider flaky tests as a friend. Now, it's easy to dismiss flaky results as a problem with the test scripts or test framework. But sometimes, they could be telling you something really important. It might be masking a key system failure. All right. The third one is really to understand the source of flakiness. Now, there could be a lot of different sources. But in my experience, these are the top four that I always come across. It's asynchronous behavior, concurrency, third-party web services calls up if you're making, and it could be the order in which you're running your tests. So let's look at them one by one. Now, asynchrony can be a boon for software because that's what keeps our browser responsive while it goes back to the server and gets the response. If you see the code snippet there, once we make the asynchronous call, it's a common mistake here is to throw in a sleep and then read the server response. Now this particular test script will fail if the server response comes after five seconds. So if you're still putting sleep in your code, wake up people. Use intelligent weights instead. Why? Because if you use conditional weights, then you don't have to worry about the network timeouts. And if you're using Selenium WebDriver, then Selenium WebDriver has uh, explicit weight class or fluent weight classes that ca you can use to poll the response. Now the tests that are running just stable when run in isolation can fail when you run them in parallel. And the reason could be uh, it could run into race condition or a deadlock. So a best practice really is to always thread safe your test code and make them independent so that they don't have any dependency issues when you run them in parallel. And avoid having shared test data or test accounts if you're using one. And if you're making third-party service calls, I highly recommend you use mock servers in order to mock uh, any third-party uh, third calls. Now the fourth and my favorite point is to love your test code as much as you love your application code. And why is that important? It's important because a, a robust test automation framework is really the foundation of creating reliable and stable tests. We want to use the same software engineering principles that we use for creating our applications. We use page object model, which is a very popular design pattern that's used in creating end-to-end -end user interface tests. Um, and we also want to use static code analysis to make sure that your code, your test code quality is the same standards as your application code quality. All right, the fifth one and something that I'm really, really excited about is using emerging technologies like machine learning driven technologies that are coming in the market right now. In the past two years, there have been a lot of different technologies that are coming in the market to resolve these pain points in test automation, to detect flakiness, to help make more maintainable test scripts. Now, some of them are Mabel, Functionize, TestSim, Retest. I'm evaluating a couple of tools right now. So 
It's really difficult to say whether or not these are going to fulfill the promise of creating maintainable test scripts, but the future definitely looks very promising. Now I want to give you an example of self-healing test script. So here's the developer making a change in the login button, and here is the, the testim.io, which is one of the self-healing tools I mentioned that is healing it automatically and updating the test script. So that is eventually, that is going to definitely help us create more maintainable tests because it can self-heal itself. So here you can see if it changed the name of the uh, login button, it was automatically updated in the locators for the test script. So the future for automated testing really looks promising. So far, what you have seen is the technical challenges that we have faced in implementing reliable testing solutions. But what really differentiates a high-performing team from a low-performing team is its culture. And remember, culture is always more important than tools and technologies. A culture of continuous quality requires each and every team member to be accountable for quality. So if you're wondering, so if you're a developer and you are wondering how you can help with quality, then maybe you can, create, you can help with quality by making your code more testable. Or maybe you can do more TDD, test-driven development. Or maybe you can write more unit tests. And if you're an operations person, maybe you can help us by creating Docker containers or creating Jenkins pipeline. And if you are a product owner in a Scrum team, maybe you can help us by including automated testing in your definition of done. So quality is really a team sport. And with that, I want to point out some key takeaways for my talk. Test automation is a must if you don't want your car to go off the cliff. Trust is crucial. Flaky tests should not be tolerated. And everyone participates in quality. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have a couple of minutes left, so I can take some questions. Any questions or comments? Hey, I just wanted to plus one your point about flaky tests being your friends. Um, I had a very similar situation recently where flaky tests, right, we assumed it was just a problem with the build node or some obscure thing. and. Um, when I actually looked into it, it was a real problem with the core thing. So I just wanted to, like, real world example to, to confirm Awesome. That. So I guess I'm curious about the transition from a culture that does largely manual testing to, to where you're, you're talking, we're all going with the automated test. How do, you, how do you get the people to go along with this transition that's usually threatening in a lot of ways? First of all, that is a great question, and I have been asked this question a lot of times. Um, this is something that I'm really, really passionate about, and I have worked a tremendous amount of, amount of my time has been given in transitioning our functional testers into automation skills. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, it does take time and effort, but as long as there is a buy-in from the leadership and also uh, curriculum around getting them transitioned into getting those technical skills, that's really important. So what has really helped uh, me in transitioning our functional testers is uh, getting the right tools, first of all, and then getting them the right training, because we want to get our testers ready for the future. And if we are not investing in, in them today, uh, we are really missing out on it. So it's really, really important that we do it both from bottoms up and top down from leadership uh, buy-in to help them grow into that role. Uh, one question I have is about uh, when you have non-repeatable testing, but you still want to do kind of the DevOps pipeline and continuous integration on it where the results are definitely going to be, you know, statistic-based and things like that that are going to change uh, depending on the input data just inherently. Uh, I guess what methods would you have? I mean, that kind of is like a flaky test, I guess, that you mentioned, but 
uh, when you're expecting that as your results, have you come across any tools to kind of help with that? So for non-repeatable tests, you're saying? Uh, yeah, so the, so the, thing gener the thing you want to test is going to produce results that are not repeatable. So you have to, but you still want to make sure it's working and that it's not a, a bug. You want to make, you want to be able to actually test it to make sure. I mean, yeah. currently we use behavioral type tests where we set kind of higher and low bounds. I just was curious if there's any other things out there that kind of you've come across to help with that problem. Yeah, uh, one of the tools that we have recently used on one of the applications where we had really aggressive timelines and the application was constantly changing because we, we were on an aggressive timeline. And that's where we used a crowdsourced tool called Rainforest QA. Uh, it's basically they have like 60,000 manual testers all across the globe wherein you can submit your test scripts and then they can manually run and give you results in less than 15 minutes. So it's kind of like manual testing at the speed of automation. We specifically chose that tool for that application was because we didn't have the time um, to invest in automation because it was moving so fast. The application itself was changing so drastically. So that's where, you know, um, of course, there's no one size fit all tool that can suffice to uh, all the situations, but there are tools that are specifically meant for specific situations. Hi. Um, so I'm wondering, what are some good resources for learning how to do this? Like, say you've never done automated testing before. What do you recommend to, like, pick up? So um, I use a lot of blogs, and I follow a lot of uh, testing leaders. Some of the good blogs that you can really go to, seleniumhq.com, um, that's a really good one. I follow Google Testing Blog a lot because they have really good insight into uh, different testing techniques. So those are really good ones. But I have a list that I can share with you after the talk, if you're interested. Hi there. Hi. Uh, I was wondering if you had any insight as to uh, when testing might um, expose issues or defects in requirements so that you're, you're testing for a condition and you, you realize after the fact that we didn't get the right thing or the, the specification was wrong somehow. Yes, a lot of us uh, write our a lot of us write our acceptance tests in a Gherkin kind of format, which is like a BDD format, uh, given when then. So it's really, uh, so when we come up with that Gherkin kind of format, uh, given when then, it's a combination of your product owner, developers, and QAs working together in order to define what that looks like. So when you're defining the same test and everybody has the shared understanding of what we are going to test, I think it is going to definitely point out if there are any laps in the gaps in the requirements there. So using a common tool, uh, that everybody understands is really, really the key to uh, figure out those gaps. I All right. Yeah. I wondered whether you had any thoughts on uh, technologies like QuickCheck to stop humans writing um, really bad tests. So using software to, to write good tests. Sorry, say that again. Uh, you said quick test? Quick check. Quick check. OK. Yeah, I'm not sure uh, if, uh, at least I have not come across any of that, any of that tool. Yeah. All right. Kay. Any other questions? Right over here. Let's do one more. Oh, yeah. We got two more, actually. Okay. Hey, um, I just want to kind of uh, uh, point out about the, the flaky test. To me, it seems like a little bit more uh, systematic problem where uh, if you have a test that one time passes, the other time fails, uh, it seems like there is a, maybe a problem with the tool or with the process of creating the test cases. Um, I don't know, do you have any, any thoughts about uh, how to kind of trust the, the, automated, t the automated test cases and so that uh, if something fails, people actually look into it and not just, just assume that maybe it's a problem with the test case? 
Yeah, so I think the important thing here is to note that, you know, the, what is the source of flakiness? And like I mentioned in the talk, there could be a lot of different sources. It could be with the problem with the test script or it could be the problem with the application or the test environments. So you have like a lot of different variables there that come into the play. But the key really is to start to, to, to build that trust, it's really, really important that we keep a tab at it and not ignore those tests. So when you have broken builds in your continuous integration pipeline, it's really important that we don't ignore it as a team and uh, commit to really fixing it. So as soon as there is any broken uh, test or test script in your CI pipeline, you go fix it, find what is the solution and not just let it go idle and ignore it. Just a follow-up question on that. Uh, is there any way to validate the test case before you're actually testing the application? Do you, like, do you write a test to the test code to make sure that the test code is actually a good one? Sorry, I could not hear the last part. So is there any way to validate the test code? Um, maybe to write a test that tests the test code? <laughs> Definitely. I highly, highly encourage everyone to write test code in order to test your test script. So that's, if, if you can get to that level, I think that's really, really important. And there are a lot of teams that are doing that, writing tests in order to test your test scripts. Great question. So actually related to that question, what do you think about the coverage of the test? Do you trust the coverage tools to, to verify that or is there a different thought on that? Yeah, so depending on which layer we are talking about, we use different unit testing um, test coverage tools like R curve. If you're using Ruby test, Ruby unit test, we use R curve. And for JavaScript, there are a lot of uh, different uh, test coverage tools that you can use. Uh, one thing is that with functional tests, it's really difficult to find that test coverage because you're testing end-to-end -end test coverage. And that's where you want to make sure that you know, you're using a BTD kind of a tool that can help you know how much of a coverage you have for each feature. All right. uh, are there, thank you for the tool uh, recommendations. Are there any tools that you would recommend like specifically against as being a nightmare, like hypothetically test NG? <laughs> All right. Just, just, just wanted to make sure that you know that um, I have used TestNG for at least a couple of years. I started my career as a Java developer and then got into testing while doing TestNG. So um, I, I, I love that tool. I love that tool. Um, it, it's really, really helpful. The, the point here is like tool is not important. I think what is really important is the technical skills your uh, testers have. So in my case, like uh, in my current organization, we didn't have a lot of uh, technical testers who could write Java code, because TestNG is a Java-based uh, test framework. But, but places where, you know, in teams where you have more technical testers, um, I would highly recommend, because whatever tool makes them more productive in writing the test scripts, that's where, uh, that's where you should adopt that. All right. Okay, awesome. Put your hands together one more time for Joji. Thank you.